3.38. We're a little late in starting this morning. We're waiting for some committee members and, um, and folks to, and folks who are gonna testify witnesses uh, to sign on and get ourselves organized. So I wanna welcome everyone this morning. Um, the first person we're gonna start with is David Schur from the uh, Attorney General's office to go through uh, the highlights of the bill and their take on it. So David, I'm gonna turn it over to you. If you could identify yourself for the record, that would be great. Certainly, and thanks for having me this morning. I am David Chair from the Attorney General's office and I am here to testify in S338 and to voice our strong support for the bill. We are really appreciative of the work that has gone in to producing this bill um, and the issue of introducing due process into post-incarceration supervision, or introducing increased due process, I should say, in, into post-incarceration supervision. Uh, as well as lowering the rate of um, readmittances is something that we've been interested in for a number of years now and really excited to see this move forward. And we're grateful to this committee for making the time and effort to take this up in uh, challenging circumstances. Um, as the committee knows well, this is really the product of a lot of work done by uh, CSG, Council on State Governments, and the Justice Reinvestment Grant that came through last year. Uh, and I want to express my gratitude to them. They did really extraordinary work. I hope others have been praising them as well. Um, but I would join that praise in thanking them. They, they really did remarkable work, produced some really remarkable uh, research and statistics. And even beyond this bill, I'd really recommend to the committee to review some of the reports that they produced. There's really just a goldmine of data in there that tells us a lot about how our system works. And um, I see Ellen is on the call and thanks to Ellen, she's certainly part of that group and they just did great work. And so we're really glad for what they did and we're glad for the bill that's resulted. Um, I, I won't spend a lot of time going through the technical aspects of the bill, although I, because I believe I, the committee has been hearing about that and will continue to hear that about that. Um, I, 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 we strongly support the structure that has been worked out with a sort of presumptive parole option for those who are eligible and a fairly strong presumption that people will go into presumptive parole um, and a high standard for uh, choosing not, or I should say a, cha a more challenging standard to meet for choosing not to have people go into presumptive parole. All of that we believe is a good way forward. Um, and we think that the system as it's been designed is, is, is really a good one. I think that there's obviously going to be coordination that will have to be done between the parole board and DOC in making sure this actually works well, but I, I have no doubt that they will um, get that done and, and make that workable. Um, the other piece that I would like to bring up, and I'm also happy to answer any questions. I certainly was involved in working out some of the detail aspects of it. So I'm happy to answer any questions if people have any on that, but I don't want to take up too much time. So as I said, I know others will be delving into those details as well. Um, the only other piece that I, I would bring up, um, which I believe was brought up by Eitan Nasreddin Longo yesterday on the bill, and I also serve as the Attorney General's Office's representative to the Racial Disparities Panel that Eitan shares. Um, and that was just to echo what I believe he was uh, talking about with respect to section 19A and the data collection piece. And I would echo that aspect of it and just say, I do think the racial disparities panel would be a good uh, voice to have as part of that process, um, making sure that they are involved in the construction of a better and more complete data collection. Um, effort for the state and figuring out ways in which we can really make that consistent statewide and understand what's really happening, not just from the police operations side, but all the way through uh, the court operations as well, which I think is really where we don't have a lot of transparency at the moment. Um, and in terms of decision-making and the sort of high discretion, high impact uh, decision points that we talk about. 
And that was an area that the panel really spent a lot of time talking about and working on and learning about. And so I would encourage um, adding the racial disparities panel to, to the group of entities that's working on that. And that would really be our only ask at this point, but I would, again, happy to be helpful uh, as I can be with respect to other aspects of the bill as we go through and try to figure stuff out. Um, and I would also say, seeing this bill get to the finish line is really our priority above all and, and happy to um, uh, help with that and compromise in whatever ways need to happen to make that um, get to the finish line. So thank you very much to the committee for taking up what we view as a really uh, essential piece of legislation and one that's really gonna have a huge, what we believe will be a really significant impact um, on the system and a positive impact. Thank you. Well, thank you for that, David. And I was gonna ask you about the racial disparity uh, section. So you did answer that. And um, also I, I wanna assure people that S338 is a priority. Um, we <clears throat> are committed to working on the bill and um, getting it through the finish line. The question is, we don't know that time frame for the finish line. Um, we're trying to figure things out and this bill may not uh, even get to the full house until sometime in May. It doesn't mean that we're not uh, supportive of it. It's just the timing in terms of um, trying to get through any or keeping open other bills, um, trying to deal with the COVID-19 emergency first. And then we need to deal with our capital bill and this bill probably in May is what it's beginning to look like from what um, I'm hearing. And that doesn't mean to say that we're not gonna be uh, supportive of it. It just will be, our legislative session is not functioning at the same rate of speed as if we were in the building. And just for folks to be cognizant of that and have patience. And I think one of the keys too that we really <clears throat> want to make sure with this legislation and any changes that we make, that we do our due diligence in making those changes, but also aware that this is a Senate bill and that we need to do some circling back with the respective committee that did the initial work on this bill to see if we can come to agreement so we do not need to go into a conference committee. So saying that to let people know. Questions of David? Butch? Thanks, Alice. David, good morning. And then Sarah. Morning. Uh, David, you talked about putting the uh, racial disparities panel into the bill. And yesterday, when Aton was testifying, I never get it, I can't say it. Anyway, when he was Aton. testifying, Aton. <laughs> testifying yesterday, he mentioned the same thing, and, and uh, it, it makes some sense. Uh, they are mentioned in section 19 under uh, parentheses B, uh, but I think uh, how. But they're not in print, print A, in the first set part of the section. It might get you want them included in, in part A of that uh, group that's going to work with crime research group. That's exactly right. The hope would be to be included in 19A, print A, um, because that was really the data okay. piece. And I will okay. circle back with um, to, to make sure everybody's on the same page and understand what's been happening. I will circle back with some judiciary members to explain that um, the, the panel simply didn't meet during, a, because they meet once a month, it was just a matter of timing. It wasn't a matter of coming in late and making a late ask. It was just a matter of timing. They didn't meet during the chunk of time the Senate judiciary was discussing the bill. And when they did meet, that was just the one thing they identified as something that they thought would be a good change. And so I'll circle back and let Senate Judiciary know why the timing worked out the way it did. Okay. That would be a help. And, right. Uh, 
So then do we still need uh, parentheses B under section B? Well, that's working with the sentencing commission. Yeah, the, right. I do read those as doing right. um, two different, two different of chunks work. of work, and okay. I think they're both worth pursuing. Um, and in both instances, I would envision the dis racial disparities panel as being a essentially a sort of consulting entity to that work. Um, but I think we'll be able to lend a worthwhile uh, lens to it and, and having done some real work on some of these issues. Sure. And I guess my last question, Dave, David, is uh, in, in Prene, uh, it says each stakeholder identified in this subsection shall report their findings to just a, it, and I, I'm sure you worked on this with, with the folks. Uh, what's your take on that? That says each state, sounds to me like we're gonna get five or six different reports. Is that your take on that or do you know? That's a good question. <laughs> and I'm not sure if that was really the intention here. I, I think I will say, speaking for myself, that I had envisioned it as more of a, um, a cooperative venture that would result in a report. It may well be the, you know, these are all different um, systems that obviously overlap very closely, but they all have their own, um, they have visibility into different aspects of the system. So it certainly might make sense that in the report, it would be, uh, there'd be different angles that would be included from the different entities. But my understanding of it had really been that this was gonna be a cooperative venture which I think okay. makes more sense in terms of trying to have a unified system. Okay. Um, if that needs to be clarified, certainly I think that would be reasonable to do. Okay. So you're the first person I've asked that question to. So I'm taking a poll now. Okay. Thank you, Alice. Okay, Sarah. Thank you. Hi, good morning, David. Good um, morning. I um I appreciate your, your support and involvement in all of this, and I just wanted to ask you um, about one of the things that you said, just to make sure that I'm tracking it. Um, that you uh, you supported this this notion of for presumptive parole for the, the high standard you know, that the DOC needs and the parole board uh, DOC needs to meet a, a high standard. So I'm look, trying to track that in the bill. I think it's in section ten. Um, there's a, where um, in E2, is that right? The department shall recommend per presumptive release for each eligible inmate unless it determines based on clear and convincing evidence. Um, we, we had heard from the parole board that they were interested in lowering that to a preponderance of evidence. And I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about it so that um, I'm sure I'm clear in understanding. Sure, and I, I think, we're coming at it from the standpoint of, we really want to make sure that um, we're operating with the presumption uh, actually being effective. Mm -hmm. And so we want that presumption to work and to be utilized. And I certainly believe that the department will be doing that, but I also think that it is important to have it be codified that it is a, high standard to, um, to determine not to do that. And I think that's, you know, I, I, I know that current department uh, leadership is completely on board and is gonna make this work. And I wanna make sure that as we move into the future um, and years down the road, folks who weren't part of this process who are now operating the system will have the same directive that it's a high standard to meet in order to ensure that, um, we are actually utilizing the sort of the alternative pathways that are being created by the bill. So you'd recommend that we keep it the way it is, it, 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 the way that it's currently written. That's right. Yeah, great. So put, to put that in English, David, what, what you're saying is that in order to deny someone a presumptive parole, DOC needs a higher level, level of standard to prove that they are not eligible. Yes, that's a fair way to put it. In English. That Where if it, was if it was preponderance of the evidence, that's a lower proof level. 
So if it's clear and convincing, it's a higher level. Yes, exactly. Thank you for stating that plainly. English, putting it in English, not legalese. Yes, we, lawyers are the worst for making themselves understood. Particularly when there's more than one lawyer in the room, right? <laughs> exactly. Any other questions? So, it, you know, the Attorney General's Office and DOC appear to be on the same page with that higher standard that's needed um, to deny someone presumptive parole. That had been my understanding. I, it, obviously, things have been a little chaotic recently. I haven't had a chance to check in in the way that I normally would with. Right, I know. But that had been my understanding that in the Senate side, there had been agreement on that, but I obviously defer to DOC in terms of their um, stance on that. Okay. Any other questions for Dave, David? Are we good to go? Okay, let's turn it over to DOC. David, if you wanna stay hooked in, you're welcome to, or if you wanna go do other work, and leave us, that's fine as well. I'll leave it up to you to decide. Thank you. Is that I'll, fair? I'll stay available, but turn myself off for, for now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank and you. if anything comes up, you can always email me too or Phil. Sounds good. Okay. Thank Will you. Do. Thank you. So I'm going to turn it over to DOC. I don't know if it would be Monica first or Dale, however you folks want. Nope, I will, this is Dale, Dale Crook, okay. Director of Field Services uh, for the Vermont Department of Corrections for the record. Um, Representative uh, Emmons, I'm not sure how you want me to go through. This is a pretty thick bill, 30, 20 okay. sections. I can kind of break it down section by section if you want, or I can kind of clump it in chunks like probation and kind of go through that. Um, there are a couple of tweaks that we would like to, to have considered to really to clear up the language a little bit, make it a little bit easier for everyone to understand um, mm -hmm. without really, without, I don't think we're changing what the intent of the language was. It's just when you're looking at it and trying to implement something, some of the language is a little wonky and it, was, and it wasn't, it could be interpreted a few different ways. Um, I but would overall, suggest probably just do it in the clumps. Okay. Not, not have um, to go section by section, but the probation section is there's three sections, but it's all together. Yeah. So, so overall, we are in favor of of, of this bill. Um, so the probation section. What really the big the big change with the probation section here is. Um, Excuse me, Dale. Do you have something going on in the background? Yeah, my uh, wife's working in my office too. Oh, okay. <laughs> We're both. I'm sorry. I can. Uh, try to leave if it helps I can go to a different room um but we're both kind of stuck working at home i'm sorry about that no, that's fine if it, um, if it affects folks on the phone or just let me know okay okay um i can also so, go through those gals pardon i can also go through them if it's easier no i let let dale start and then we'll go from there um so the really what the the big change to the probation section is it allows credit for probation time. Um, this seemed to be kind of uh, something missing in our system. Um, uh, so someone could have a sentence that was imposed um, and they could be on probation for a period of time and then get that probation revoked and they would have no credit added to their sentence and they basically start as a brand new sentence over again. Um, the way that the department supervises now as we supervise based on risk and, and legal status and stuff like that. So the legal status is, doesn't really impact how the department supervises an individual as we're supervising more based on risk. So a furloughee, a probationer and a parolee um, at the similar levels of risk are getting supervised the same way. Um, and the parolee and the furloughee would end up getting credit. Um, so, and the probationer wouldn't. So it just seemed like it would make things a little clear, cleaner um, it would help move individuals through the system quicker. Um, and it also um, still yeah, allow um, <laughs> individuals to are in non-compliance yeah, to still be revoked and still be held accountable for that action. Um, so the, the first one was really about, about indicating that. And the second one, in the second section, let me go there. Um, 
Uh, and oh, Dale, Dale, before you move on, so it's it's um, this is why I need some clarification. Um, they're earning credit towards is it just towards their minimum? And if they meet, say their minimum is three years and they have a maximum of seven, so they've done really well for three years on probation, so that calculates towards the three year minimum. So then they would not have to serve a minimum. Okay. So is, do, the, okay. is the seven, is the max still in play? Um, no, so they would be getting, so, so let me simplify this. Someone has, let's say a two year to four year sentence and they're on probation for a year and for whatever happens, they get revoked. So that two to four year, they'd get a year of credit applied. So in effect, they'd have a one to three now is what, what they would have to serve um, as a sinister defender, unless they make parole. So it's credit as they would if they were a parolee or if they were a furloughee. It's like, it's the same. So day for day credit while on probation. So let me, let me, um, let me give an example in terms of right now. So it's a two to four year sentence, Correct. two men, two max. And if they had no, no probation and they went in and were incarcerated with a sentence of two men and four max, mm -hmm. when they reached that two years, as they met their minimum, yep. and to reach their maximum, they have two more years to go. Correct. Then you gotta go pull out your books. Well, Does that make sense to the committee? Well, on this day, I told her that. <laughs> I don't see anything, so I assume okay. it does. Alice? Yeah, Butch. I'm just a little confused, Dale. What what part of the bill are you in? I know you're in the probation, but what section within that 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 section are you are you actually talking about? So we are in. We started with section two. Section. And then I asked. Section two, and where this comes up is on page five, line two and three. And that is that the new language? Because we yeah, have oh. different versions. So we have a few different, uh, I don't want to say versions, but the way it came through. So some pages aren't tracking for everybody. Okay, so, so the language added was at all times served on probation prior to the time the violation is filed. Okay. So that's the start of it. It, it's, it says the same thing in like three, different areas mm -hmm. um uh we moved over to i just lost me hey alice if you're on that bill is introduced and passed by the senate you'd be following along with dale it'd be on page five line right. two and three that's what i have but some folks have so, the other um, on this, uh, oh, I, one is official and one is unofficial. Okay, so, so, so on section three, um, mine is page nine, uh, line 11. It starts talking about the credit and how it um, comes into effect. Um, uh, so it's the little d uh, one is where I'm at. So it talks about all probations. She'll receive one day of credit toward the probationer's minimum sentence. Um, uh, this is this is kind of how it's going to be implemented. Um, we, we would like to have added that basically the court will tell us the amount of credit that will be given. Um, we'd like that added uh, because it will save kind of confusion down the road because a lot of times um, if someone doesn't agree with the credit that the department applies, they'll just go back to court and it'll kind of, kind of go back to the to the to the area. So some language um, basically says the court will indicate the days of credit um, toward the offender uh, would would help make everything clear for everyone. So at the time of the of the sentencing at the court hearing, everyone knows what the sentence would be instead of having it uh, determined by the department later down the road. Um, I think it's just a little cleaner way of, of doing it. Um, but, but that basically kind of plays out how the, the credit will be going into to effect. Yeah. 
Um, and then so, I'm oh, so yes, uh, now <clears throat> this is just for clarity and for really understanding this. Okay. So they've reached. Uh, so they've reached their minimum on mm -hmm. They've been on probation. They reached their minimum. Yep. Do they then stay on probation Correct. to finish out their maximum? Yep. They are on probation until probation is revoked or until they uh, term out of their probation or it's discharged from the court. So they don't go to a different legal status. Only reason they'd go to furlough is if probation was revoked and they were giving a two serve sentence. Um, yeah, as long as we have the so if someone on probation um, that's past their minimum sentence gets revoked, they would be furlough eligible right from the beginning. Um, yeah. Doesn't mean they'd be on furlough, depends on the, what behavior got them there, but they would be eligible. Um, so they'd start okay. their sentence after their minimum. Right, because if their probation is revoked, mm -hmm. that means they would then be incarcerated. Correct. Just so people can follow that trail. Yeah, if it's in, if the probation is interrupted, it does yeah. not necessarily oh, mean that they're going to be incarcerated yeah, for a long time. All it, all the probation is interrupted, but it, then is it that. up to the court? So there is no inter interruption for probation. So we could file a violation, um, yeah. and then oh. depends on what the violation. If if yeah. someone absconds and we file a warrant, kind of credit stops until they are incarcerated or until they picked up or if we file a violation um, they could still earn credit um, the court will determine how much credit they get once the violation is filed um, so so it's still in play with, with the tools of, of probation i'm not sure if that's clarifying it for you um, okay no but so there is no interrupt like in so we just can't take so we don't have the department doesn't have the authority to give a sanction in jail like we would for a furlough. We don't have that authority. We can put someone in jail, we can arrest them um, like law enforcement would, like you violated conditions, your risk, we have criteria and arrest them and then, then their due process would go back before the court, not the department. So that's a big difference with probation and furlough is who kind of determines what happens with the violation process. Yeah, I know um, to, Hopefully that clarified that for you. Okay. We do have a question. I hope. So we do have a question and it's Kurt. Um, I, I, also, I also have a comment, Dale. Um, uh, just so the other person working in your office knows that this is a very public forum. And so anybody watching is hearing what she's saying as well. Um, the, my question is, uh, the way this credit works, do you see it as when the person comes off probation, the court says they receive this much amount of credit. It's therefore a reduction in sentence at that point, where the sentence would actually be changed to minimum? No, it's not a reduction of sentence per se. What it is, is the... Uh, credit applied to that as if they were a detainer. Say if someone was a detainer for six months and they got sentenced to uh, a sentence, they'd yeah, get that no, six months credit. It's kind of the same same concept as that. So once the probation is revoked and the court says you've received a year of credit based on your probation time, that year of credit would be applied to the current sentence and reduce the current sentence by a year on the min and the oh, max. Yeah. Okay, so it would actually reduce that uh, hypothetical two-year minimum to a one-year minimum. Correct. And as far as DOC's tracking it, and maybe Monica can answer this later, it would be as if they had received a minimum of one year as far as DOC is concerned. <laughs> right there. We'd still put down this, it'd be sentence comp computation. So they'd still put down the sentence that was imposed that was revoked by the court. So if it was two to four, the sentence would be two to four, but then we'd apply a credit to it. Um, so it'd be a reduction. It, it, in essence, it would be a one to three, but it was, it's a two years, but with already with a year of credit is how we would right. calculate it out. I'm just trying to think whether the DOC is going to have to keep track of that credit and say, yeah, this person had a two to four, it got one year of credit, it became a one to three, they got good time for this much, or whether it's simply their sentence 
for all intents and purposes, change to a one to three? Uh, we would probably have to, I'd have to look at Monica a little bit for that. We may have to track some of it. Um, I, I, I think a lot of it's going to be pretty straightforward. Um, someone comes on in this date and they get violated and revoked on this date. Um, we can look at a calendar. Um, it's when I think when people come in and out and there's multiple okay. sittings and dates and there's multiple violations and when cases start getting complicated is probably when the department's computation unit is going to have to really um, start tracking all those days. Okay, that makes sense. Yep. Um, this is going to have an increase um, for our classification for our classification and sentence computation unit without a doubt, just because um, there will be more uh, computations going on um, overall. Uh, but I, I think we think it's a, it's a good a, a good outcome for that. Did I clarify that for everyone? I think so, but I do, I know Butch has a question here, but let me interject just for clarity. People who are on probation do not, if we do the good time, they're not eligible for good time, correct? I believe that's the way it is currently drafted. Good time, the rule hasn't come out yet, um, but I don't think community supervision as far as probation, parole, and Monica is our good time expert right now, but I don't think um, probation, it would count toward uh, probation, the good time account toward probation. But it would the count currently currently and possibly parole, Monica? The bill as it's currently written says that probationers are not able to receive good time people or parole, but people on furlough are able to receive good time. Okay, uh, Butch? Thanks. So Dale, I just want to make sure I, who's keeping track of what uh, on a very simple, uh, like the, who's keeping track of what, what, what you explained, it sounds like DOC keeps track up to a point and then the court keeps track kind of wrapped around that when somebody's on probation, who is the gatekeeper on that time? Because actually if they're on probation, they're, better off on a getting day for day than they are on good time where they're getting a, a day for every five days or seven, whatever we land on here. Uh, so the courts keep track, you keep track, who, who runs the totals? So for violations, it's gonna be the department. So if, if no one violates, so uh, someone gets a probated sentence, um, and there's a term, there's an end date. The, the, the one to two year sentence ends in two years. At that two years, there's a date on the probation order. At that date, the, the case has been satisfied and is discharged and is closed out. Um, That's the department, the Yeah. So yeah. if there's a violation, and these are some things that are going to have to be worked out with, with the courts and, and our sentence company. So someone gets put on probation on a set date. We know what that date is. And let's say they have a violation a year later. Um, we can figure that out on, on some level. Um, I think, um, and we could say that they came on this date and they was violated on this date and the court can determine um, the dates, the, the, the amount of time that was, and then do they get credit during the violation process is what the court would also need to figure out. Um, so mm -hmm. they would get, let's say they're on for a year and then we file a violation and we keep them under supervision and it takes three months to go through that process, they'd have a year of credit. And then the court would determine during that violation time, do they get the three months credit? Did they do what they needed to do? It's, it's really a court decision at that point. Um, I think where our sentence comp unit, um, and obviously the courts can reach out to us and they do now as to what the sentences are, um, as when they start getting multiple sentencing dates and they start getting violations and they get a new sentence. And when, when we get complicated cases, um, is when the department is probably going to have to start doing sentence comps um, with our sentence comps unit. Um, but these are things that will kind of need to be hashed out between us um, and the courts uh, as we kind of go through it. It's, it's a new way of doing it, um, but I'm not concerned um, as far as us being able to do it. Okay, so when a, when a probationer is, is actually on probation doing well, they get a day, they get day for day. 
you're keeping track of that day for day time until they reach their max. So if they're doing good, what happens is there's a yes in essence, but there's like an end date. So you get a probation order and it says it's two year term and the two year ends on January 15, 2022, whatever that date is. At that mm-hmm. date, if there's no violations, the case just is done. It's termed out. Um, okay. So it closes out. So it says in this bill that the court will terminate the probation and discharge the person. Yes. Uh, and it sounds like you got to work that out. So, but but who over in the previous uh, section, maybe I'm just being a hard head here, but I want to know who's going to keep track of the day for day when somebody is on on probation. Is it you or the courts? I'm not sure. Monica, what do you think? I think uh, on some level, it would probably fall in the department. I think it would fall in the department. I'm pretty sure that the court would come back and ask us for our records and to look in the offender's file um, and see what it says in terms of their start dates and when they, basically when they were on certain legal statuses and whether or not there were any other circumstances that might have resulted in them losing credit. So you're keeping track of their probation as long as they're doing well. They get hauled back in. The court makes a decision, lets you know what the decision is. You mm-hmm. add or that credit to their time if there's a favorable decision or whatever. Then they go forward when they reach their maximum term uh, that they're on probation for. The court needs to notify you uh, who, who notifies the court? You, you, I'm guessing you will notify the courts. That they so, the no, right now the courts, um, when a case reaches its term date, which is what this would be, the court just closes it out. So so we know we everyone has the same date. So um, on that date, on the termination date that's indicated on the probation order is when the case closes out. Uh, and the court does it that. and we do it. Yeah, so we don't... Um, Go back and forth with each other. It just closes okay, so, out. It's independent still, action. That yeah. Entity takes. We close so the court order. just court just assumes if I'm done my probation next Tuesday, uh, if they don't hear from you, uh, then yep. my ter- my probation is terminated and my case is settled at that time. It's kind Correct. of like only, an automatic thing. Yep. Only time only time that comes into play is when we file a violation. If someone does everything they need to do they go till the term date or until we discharge earlier um, through a midpoint review or some action like that. Okay. So basically you're keeping track of everything except when there there's a violation and then the courts step in and help you out, figuring that out. Well, we're keeping cor- track of the violations as well. I mean, we, we know when someone's violated. The court will determine if they get credit for the violation time. So, um, it really comes into play if the court wants to give, if someone's in violation, does the court want to give them credit for that violation time? Um, and I think it's going to be, you know, at the discretion of the judge, depending on what the violation was, what the offender did to rectify the situation, compliance, or things of that nature. Yeah. And I, and, I, and I get that. It's just that, and then you kept saying, well, we're going to work it out with the courts. We're going to work it out with the courts. Uh, I got to think about that a little bit because I, I, I'm just afraid somebody or something is going to get lost on either side here. Uh, but it's probably no different than what you're doing now. I, I don't know. So, Dale, I, I just want to clarify because you had language you wanted inserted in D1. And I'm interpreting it that it would be after the first sentence there where you wanted the court to tell DOC the amount of credit given. Yeah, so, earned. So, so, so after the violation, after the judge determines, then they would give us information. Um, otherwise, the department would have to make a determination and that could be, and in, in a lot of times it ends up back in court because people disagree with whatever determination of the sentence they should have. Um, so what this does, it so kind of I'm trying puts to it, figure out where you want to put in that language. Would it be a new sentence right after yeah. that first sentence if it's for violations? Um, are we on D one, uh, page, page yep. nine, lines eleven and twelve? It's D one. I think the right after show um, 
right before if the court, the last sentence, I think we add it right before the last sentence. And that's something like the court to indicate the number of days credit and give the total number of days credit towards the sentence. Um, and that way it's clear at the time um, of the revocation hearing or the, or the violation hearing, what the credit is and what credit is applied instead of the department determining it. Um, we will, we work with the courts anyway on this, but the court will say, this is the credit that we're gonna give you uh, based on the violation. That's what that language would do. Without that language, it would fall to the department. The department would do its calculation and that would could be, um, not everyone in, at the time would know what the credit would be. And if someone disagrees with it, it could end up back in court arguing over the credit that the department applied. I, what we what the department rep would say that this is a clear way at the time of the sentencing at the revocation hearing, everyone is aware of what the credit is and it's a cleaner, neater, um, you know, everyone understands what the sentence is um, instead of having um, everyone talks about corrections math. We're trying not to do corrections math. We're trying to make sure everything is upfront and clean at the beginning when the revocation is, is issued. So I just want clarity in terms of where to insert okay. the language for the court telling DOC of the amount of credit given. It would be on line 17. Correct. It would be a new sentence after the- Shall commence, period. After yeah. shall yeah. commence, then there'd be a new sentence that the yeah. court would tell DOC. Because I, okay. Because our drafts person, I want to be really clear with Bryn in okay. terms of where some recommended changes are. Yep. And it would, we look at that same language kind of added in section four. Um, this talks about the revocation. One's about a violation, one is when it is revoked um, and a to serve. We'd want that similar language added. And that would be section four, page 10. Um, between lines 11 and 14. Um, and that would probably, that's one long sentence here, but it'd probably be somewhere um, in that section that the court would also find the credit um, that they would receive through the violation. It seems like it, it, for this little change, it's in three separate probation sections of the probation statute. Um, Okay. So we're going to be working with Bryn sometime next week yep. in terms of working with new language. And whenever that may occur, uh, we may need to circle back with you, with you folks. That's, to to that's absolutely fine. Okay. It's just difficult sometimes to do this electronically and not in a committee room. Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay. Um, <laughs> Anything else on probation? Those are the, that's the, the big key of the changes in probation. I... Butch, you had something? Yeah. I do. Uh, Dale, over in D1, uh, it says the probationer shall cease accruing credits and so on. And then uh, you asked us to put this language in uh, at the end of that. So I guess it's just a matter of process. So I'm assuming if somebody gets uh, hauled back in, uh, they, uh, you will start counting them as losing credits unless the court tells you they didn't. And then uh, the last sentence in front of your Senate says if the court finds no violation occurred, there should be no interruption in the probationers accrual of credit. Is that like a, an assumption that's being made that you won't stop their, their credits until there's a court hearing? Or... So in essence, so the court will decide what happens, right? So if there's a, a violation, let's say we file a violation, um, and at the end of that violation, the court doesn't, doesn't find the violation occurred, there would be no harm to the offender. So we file a violation, it wasn't proven in court, we're not going to take credit from the offender based on that violation. So I get hauled in court. I, I get hauled in court. I still keep getting my credits until the court says I don't. In, in essence, yeah. Um, okay. If a warrant's filed, um, 
it's understanding that that would probably stop. So if a warrant is filed on a violation, um, you can't term out. So we have a warrant. The, the VOP warrant stops the term from happening until the court hears it and either reinstates the probation or revokes. Okay. Okay. I guess. Any other questions on this piece? Anything else on probation, Dale? No, those are the big, those are the, the, the big change. Um, Okay. Do you want to move on to parole? We can do that. So parole um, kind of creates this, this presumptive parole um, and eligibility for parole. So in section six, um, the, the really big addition is kind of this compassionate language on the top of page 13, uh, number three, where, where an inmate is over 65 years of age and not serving a sentence of life without parole. Um, they're basically eligible for a parole review, even if they're not their minimum sentence. Um, so it doesn't mean that people are going to get paroled. It just means that if someone that meets this criteria, um, even though it's before their minimum sentence has occurred, they're eligible for a parole review. And if the parole board determines, could parole them um, at that time. Um, uh, then you have presumptive parole. Um, and presumptive parole kind of sits out um, the criteria for it. Right now it's for the non-listed population um, and, it, and it goes through one through five kind of the criteria to get presumptive parole. Um, one, one tweak we would like to add, to add to this is on uh, section three. Um, so it's page 13, line 16. Um, the, com the complaint of the inmates, case, or compliant with the inmates case plan during uh, a period of incarceration if the inmate is incarcerated for less than 90 days or is compliant for the 90 days proceeding to the completion of the inmate's minimum term if the inmate is incarcerated for 90 days or more. Um, we would rather have that change to basically that the inmate is compliant with their case plan in regards to required services and programming. Um, the case plans can be interpreted as a very vague in some ways. Um, and I think what what we're looking to do is if someone's doing required services or doing their risk reduction programming or attending their education that they're required to do, that, that they would be eligible for that. We don't want someone not being eligible because in their case plan, it talks about um, living an orderly industrious time in the facility and they don't make their bed. We don't, that technically they could be non-compliant. There's a lot of interpretation with the case plan. So having something very clear and concrete about what they need to require to do um, we'll just make it easier and cleaner for everyone. Um, because someone, someone could pick up a minor DR and if their case plan indicates institutional compliance, technically they would not be in compliance with their case plan if they pick up a DR for not making their bed. Um, so this just eliminates um, uh, some of the minor stuff that can get kind of the interpretation parts of what a case plan compliance is. Um, and it makes it really clean that if you're required to do it, you have to do it um, in order to be eligible for presumptive parole. Dale, could you repeat the language again, please? Um, so the current language says, is compliant with the inmate's case plan during a period of incarceration if the inmate is incarcerated for less than 90 days or is compliant for the 90 days preceding the completion of the inmate's minimum term if the inmate is incarcerated for 90 days or more. Um, right. Where would your new language go in there? It, it would replace it would replace three. It would basically it would oh, say yeah. is okay. And what it would say is compliant with case plan in regards to required services or programs um, or programming. So if someone has to do education. Um, and they're doing education, they're eligible if they meet all the other criteria. If they're not doing education and they're required by statute to do education, then they would not be eligible for presumptive parole. Um, but it kind of takes a lot of the subjectivity stuff out of, um, you know, we set up a case plan to really to work with the entire, entire individual. Um, and some things are really required and some things are, uh, are not. And this really just you know, if we want them to reduce, you know, do their mandated stuff is what we want and to kind of take the subjectivity out of, out of that requirement. 
So what you're also, if you delete, if you replace the language is currently there in number three with your proposed language, mm -hmm. you're taking out the qualifiers for less than 90 days or 90 days preceding the completion of the person's minimum. So, yes. so you're applying it, you're not qualifying it with any of these measures, you're just applying it to all inmates regardless of where they are in their sentence. Correct. So, so the required services is they have to be in them. So with programming, with our risk reduction programming, you have to be in it and you have to complete it. So if they've done that, they've met that requirement uh, that they have completed their required case plan. If they're in education and they have a case in, uh, so if they're in education, they can enroll in education and be compliant for it. So it kind of takes some of the, um, uh, the restrictors off and, and allows for um, a cleaner version where the uh, the inmate and the corrections staff know what they what the individual needs to do in order to be um, eligible for presumptive parole. So it's not so subjective. Correct. I mean, we want uh, one thing with presumptive parole. We're trying to take some of the discretion out and make it very clean and and and. Um, I guess less uh, subjective. So this is really a, a, a major, this is gonna, I'm just thinking of relaying this to our drafts person. If you could submit that language for this section to okay. Phil and myself, and there may be, as we continue, you may have some other language too. That would just help when we're working with Bryn in terms of the new draft. Yep. So you know, just don't go on committee notes and memory. No, that's fine. You know, some of the reasons for the change is really to make things simple, not simpler, but cleaner and clearer for everyone. Um, and, you know, I'm looking at implementing this um, for 1,500 inmates. So make sure that we have it clean so everyone understands. Having clarity and statute is, is, is really important. Um, it, just, it just saves issues down the road. Um, so that's presumptive parole. We're in favor of presumptive parole. Um, in a couple, in section eight, I think it turns over to listed offenders. So it kind of expands the pool. This is kind of, a, uh, this is a new, I can understand the Senate's um, uh, reasoning for this. This is kind of a new process. So let's start with the less violent group and see how that works out. Um, and if it works out well, uh, expanding it in two years. Um, is, is kind of already set up to happen. Um, if issues come around, there's also time that we're not letting, we're not putting public safety at risk at this point by presumptive paroling um, the listed or the violent population. Um, um, that was really, really the big thing was the presumptive parole. Um, what section am I in now? On section 10, release on parole, um, it kind of talks about what the department needs to do. If you look on page 19, um, it talks about the department identifying the individuals that are going to be eligible for presumptive parole. Um, and then we notify the board 60 days prior to that to that date. Um, it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, one thing we would would like to kind of clarify a little bit is on line 14 of page 19, um, the B, um, the inmate is not willing or capable of fulfilling the obligations of a law abiding citizen. Um, uh, that's a little on the subjective side, kind of what we would like to have added there is a willing or able to fulfill the obligations of parole. Um, so what we're looking at to do that, there's already, A already will eliminate the, the safety risk or people not compliant, that already eliminates them. What B will do is, is we want to make sure that someone wants to be on parole because at times we'll have individuals not wanting parole. Um, and, and the way the language is set up now, if someone doesn't want parole, they're not eligible for release on furlough. Um, so that just, it, it didn't make sense. And really um, kind of the fundamentals process of supervision is that everyone leads a law abiding life. Um, what this does is say, here's your parole, uh, presumptive parole, are you going to be able to fulfill those requirements of parole? And if the offender says yes, they say yes. If they say no, uh, it wouldn't make them ineligible for 
furlough release in this bill with the new language. Why would someone not want parole? What would be some of the... Uh, good times, sometimes parole puts on more conditions um, and restrictions than what furlough will allow sometimes. Um, sometimes people don't mind, for, it, it, it's it, multiple reasons. I think what's gonna come into play with um, in the future with this is when good time comes into play. Um, if furloughees get good time and parolees don't, there will be a big incentive for, there could be an incentive for someone to stay on furlough and earn their good time as opposed to being on parole. But um, I think we're gonna change that for good time so that parole, they can also earn good time. Is that correct? I think we're changing that, aren't we? Not in the language I have. Um, but that was a discussion somewhere along the way. I remember that somewhere. So that might be something we also want to think about. Yep. Okay. Um, so, and everyone was talking, I know, um, the clear and convincing evidence. Um, I'm not, I believe that came about through prisoners' rights. Um, I don't know if that was, I think it was just more of a discussion within the committee about the evidence laid out there and we were fine with clear and convincing. Um, it's, it's, it's for, you know, operationally, it's, it's cleaner and easier to implement. Um, but also you're, you're using clear and convincing evidence on kind of, um, you know, if you look at A, a reasonable probability. So I'm not sure um, having a reasonable probability, you know, if it's clear and convincing or proponents of, an, of, of the evidence for a reasonable probability, it just, it, I'm not sure how much those two um, standards are gonna make a difference. We're fine with either, we can make either work. Um, so we're not really pushing um, clear and convincing or um, I think it was preponderance. Um, either is fine with us. Um, we'll, we can make either work. Um, so Dale, the, uh, uh, we, we heard from the parole board that uh, they would prefer uh, preponderance of evidence. It's, they seem to feel it gives them a little more latitude and, and uh, and would like that changed. Uh, can you can you comment on that? Well, it's, it's um, these are really determinations by the department, so it doesn't um, impact the parole board decision, so to speak. At that point, what this does is, as we're implementing this, um, you know, clear and convincing evidence is is a pretty high standard. So I mean, this is kind of a policy. So if we're really looking at individuals on presumptive parole. Um, and we think that's going to be the standard. And I know some of the discussion um, in the judiciary was about at some point getting rid of furlough, um, that you're going to need to have some clear evidence why, um, why this individual that meets all the other criteria before is not, um, not, not going to be eligible for presumptive parole. Um, and it's really, and, and it's, and, um, it does leave a little, it's, in some ways it's easier for the department to implement because it's clear and convincing. It's pretty straightforward um, as opposed to, to, there's a lot more um, discretion with preponderance of the evidence. Um, that's, it's, it's more, it's, 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 it's a lower, I mean, that's why it's a lower standard because there's lower requirements for it. Um, but as I said before, the department's not really pushing one way or the other. We can make either work. Um, I think where we might have some of the impact is on challenging later down the road, um, if, if we get challenged in court, um, how to defend, you know, clear and convincing, pretty, pretty standard, it's a pretty high level. Um, so we have to, the department really has to have really good evidence. Preponderance, it's, it's a lower standard, um, a lot more, a lot more wiggle room, for lack of a better word, as to how our decisions are made. Um, uh, so you don't see clear you don't see clear and convincing as, as a barrier to uh, recommending somebody to be on, uh, on, on, on this status? I, I don't see it having much of an impact. Okay. Um, uh, it, it, 
it could, but I, right now I don't foresee it as being a huge impact. I don't think, you know, one way or the other, it's not going to swing. We're going to have 200 uh, one way and 50 the other. I think it's going to be very minimal if, if really much of an impact. Okay. Uh, anybody got any questions to Dale so far on this particular section? Okay, Dale, go ahead. No. Um, furloughs changing a little bit. I'll just move on to furlough. The temporary furloughs is just kind of cleans it up based on all the other changes. It's kind of a technical update. Um, and Dale, it's I, Dale, I have a question. I'm sorry I was muted. I didn't oh. realize it. Um, so did you, I had to scoot out for a minute. Um, did you talk about the parole board, when we heard testimony from the parole board, they were concerned it's clear and convincing because they use preponderance of the evidence. Yes. And they were concerned how that would play. Did you address that while I was out of the room? Yes, ma'am, I can go over it again if you would like. No, I'll, I'll figure that out with the committee. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so section 11, they really kind of take our current furlough and added temporary and kind of cleaned up some of the other language based on all the, the new changes coming down. Um, and we're, we're fine with all of that. Um, well, one thing it does is on uh, page 22, line 13, it gets rid of the 808F, which is a lack of housing, um, which we're in favor of that, uh, that really, um, created some issues as far as public safety was concerned. Um, and we're glad that the, this draft has that removed. Um, treatment furlough on section 12, it's really just kind of clean up. Um, a lot of this is clean up. One of the things we're doing with the furlough that, that, that um, CSG and what this uh, JRI bill does is it really cleans up and simplifies furlough. It gets rid of um, Furloughs are very complicated, and there's a lot of um, offshoots and different status and different variations of it. This really cleans it up um, because one of the you know the thoughts is that we are so complicated, um, and furlough is so complicated that it's actually uh, to to our disadvantage um, that we're dealing with um, so much administrative burden that we're not actually able to to supervise um, the offenders well. Uh, so that's what a lot of the furlough stuff does. Um, uh, and one section for section 13, um, uh, furlough um, will become community supervision furlough. So our, our normal conditional reentry is our standard furlough. When, you, when people talk about furlough, for the most part, they're talking about conditional reentry. That's at, at your minimum, you're eligible for release. Um, it's now replaced with this community supervision furlough. Um, it still has a lot of the same nuts and bolts as conditional reentry, um, but I think it, it kind of changes the name. We'll have um, um, allow us to look at it a little differently uh, as a department. Um, one little tweak we'd like to add is on page 25, um, line four on number two, is ineligible or refuses presumptive parole of this section. So um, that kind of adds that uh, caveat. If someone refuses presumptive parole, we still want to be able to release them if they're appropriate for release. So that just kind of codifies a previous section um, to that. Um, could, you, could you mention that again? I'm sorry, Dale. I was yep. writing notes on, on something nope. else. On page 25, line four, number two, it says, um, is ineligible for presumptive parole presumed? Mm -hmm. We would like to add, is ineligible or refuses presumptive parole? And in that case, if someone says, I don't want presumptive parole for whatever reason, um, we can still release them if they're appropriate for release. Um, so it just seems um, that it was missing that someone might not want, you know, we can't force parole upon someone. Um, so it has to be, a, 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 they have to choose to have it. I um, mean, we don't want someone not, you know, choosing to for presumptive parole for whatever reason, we don't want to have to limit them from being released. Um, um, then we go on to the terms of community supervision on section 14. Um, a lot of this is um, adding, adding, um, how do I put this? It's, it's putting more protections in for offenders during violation processes and allowing um, 
offenders to have uh, just a greater amount of due process. It will allow, f um, for example, if, if the department uh, interrupts or revokes um, an individual for more than 30 days, we notify prisoners' rights. So if they think that that decision is inappropriate, they can challenge us. Um, you know, one of the, this came from prisoners' rights and the department was fine because it, it's transparency in what we do. Um, and I think as a government entity that impacts individuals' liberty, I think we should be as transparent as possible. And, that, and this allows that to happen. Um, it allows cases uh, to go back before the court that they weren't able to go back before uh, previously. So we have a question, Dale. Uh, Kurt? Uh, yeah, uh, you, sorry to go back a little ways here, back to page 22, um, line 20 on yours, I believe is the same of mine. It has to do with um, sec subsection G, and you mentioned that it does remove that subsection B and um, dash F. That's the, the housing one, right? Correct. Yes. So, so does that, what's the implications of that? Does that mean that more people would, could be released even though there is no adequate housing? No, this prevents someone from being released if they're held for lack of housing. Okay. So um, when, when this language first came out, it must've been eight or nine years ago when we started looking at this, the department started tracking some of its data. And what it found out is that individuals that were released without appropriate housing or approvable housing reoffended at a much higher rate than those that were actually higher risk that had stable release plans. And so what okay. this really indicated was um, having a stable place to live has an impact on, on people's success. Um, you know, we're sending out, you know, lower risk individuals with really bad release plans because that's the only thing we're held, holding them in for. And, and they just reoffended at a much higher rate. Um, the higher risk individuals that we released that had good release plans reoffended at a lower rate than the lower. So it just really emphasized that as a public safety tool, um, if we're looking at that, that we should make sure that we have good plans and approvable housing when releasing individuals. Um, and that's all that does. It, it was in. Um, but, but removing that, how does that affect it? I, by removing that section, aren't you then saying that you don't need to have the adequate housing? No, what this does is we won't, we won't release you homeless, basically what it says. If oh. you're homeless, we won't release you homeless or without an appropriate approvable plan. Okay. Um, so Kurt, 808F was really being emphasized, started about five years ago, four or five years ago, that yeah. <clears throat> um, DOC could not hold someone back from furlough if they did not have adequate housing. They had to furlough them regardless if they had adequate housing or not. Oh. That's what 808 says. And that has created a lot of problems out there. If you talk to probation parole officers, the 808F, uh, there were a lot of folks out there with no housing. I see, but it uh, but 808F also does say that the provided that public safety and best interests of the offender will be, and so on. That is true, but, but there was legislation. There was something somewhere, Dale, a few years ago. I think it was four or five years ago that it really said DOC is going to do 808F, yeah. and, and they did. We had a must have been eight or nine years ago. Um, something okay. where basically said we're going to release we're going to release them and I think out of the 100 people we released like 25 we didn't because we just did not feel good about that um, and that's a lot where we get started getting a lot of our data about the outcomes because it takes three years to get recidivism outcomes and that's and that's after we saw that we said um, this is not good I mean in some ways we couldn't supervise individuals they didn't have a we couldn't go check them in the in the field because they didn't have a house, they didn't have a residence. So they either couch surfing or they were going to places that they shouldn't have. Um, and it, 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 the, the data and the research indicated that it was bad outcomes 
for that population. And that if we okay. want to look at public safety and offender success, we should have good release plans and, and, and provable housing. All right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so we did section 14. Um, uh, I, I'll let uh, section 15 is just kind of clean up language. Um, I'll let Monica talk about uh, section 16 in a good time. Um, this is really her, um, what she's been working on. She can speak to it much more eloquently than I can. Okay. Thank you, Dale. This was very good. If you could submit, particularly that section that you want to replace the language, the 90 days with the case plan, if you could at least submit that language to us so we're clear in what you're looking for. Yep. So when we work with Bren, we're clearer. Send it to you or send it to you and Bren or? Send it to it. both Bren and me. Correct. Cool. Okay. I can do that. Okay. Okay, let's shift to good time. Monica, let's have a good time, huh? Okay, well, we'll try. Um, good morning, everyone. I think it's some way. Monica Weaver, Administrative Services Director for the Department of Corrections. And uh, just to reiterate what um, Dale said, you know, the department is um, overall supportive of the bill and the types of information that we're putting forward here are sort of more technical types of changes in order to make the different aspects of the bill easier for us to implement and more clear um, for people. So the um, section 16 is the section on good time. We've spent a lot of um, time uh, reviewing this section. The changes that were made in the Senate Judiciary that I want to address first are really in this um, first section around um, the filing of the rule and the timing of the filing of the rule. Um, so there's a little confusing language in there. Um, my understanding overall around the effectiveness or the effective date of most of the changes that are in S338 are that they go into effect on January 1st, 2021. And the Council of State Governments um, made their recommendations thinking that all of these uh, components would be effective January 1st, and they put out the projections around you know, what that could potentially do to the offender uh, population, the incarcerated population with that, with that start date. Um, so for some reason in the Senate, this date of October 1st, 2020, it was put in there for the department to file a rule and have good time be effective on October 1st, uh, 2020. Um, which is slightly conflicting with the overall intent of the January 1st. So I would ask that the committee think about the implementation. Um, when this was passed a year ago and we had to file the rule on July 1st, 2020, I think I shared with the committee that it, even if that would be a little bit difficult to go through all of rulemaking and have the good time rule um, implemented after um, the formal rulemaking process is complete. Um, I believe right now that- Emergency rules are an expedited process. Right, I understand. It also means that it, an so emergency agree. rule would be implemented immediately. Right, so this, this says that we would file a rule and that we would implement good time on October 1st. What it says is you would file for the rule. It doesn't mean that the rule goes into effect on July 1st. It's by July 1st, you would file. And that those items that you filed would become the emergency rule. It says, and there is a process that and maybe this is something that Bryn needs to say. So we file a rule on July 1st. Um, to have good time become effective on October 1st. And that we have to adopt that as an emergency rule and propose the final rule at the same time. So that earned good time 
the earned good time program becomes effective on October 1st. I think the thinking is you file it, becomes the emergency rule, and good time is effective on October 1st under the emergency rules. Right, I understand and then that. You go and then However, you go forward and promulgate the final rules. Right. So our, our issue is with the uh, having good time be effective on October 1st, 2020. Um, we provided testimony earlier that it would be difficult for us to have it effective on January 1st, 2021. Uh, and now the date's been pushed back several months, uh, which would make it even more challenging. And so I'm not sure we really uh, understood the reasoning for pushing it back. We also uh, would request, uh, quite honestly, more time than the January 1st start date that was in the original bill to implement good time, um, just given all of the other things the department is managing right now and trying to implement that program would be challenging under these circumstances. What, what would you what would you what would you suggest for a date? Uh, we were thinking um, March first of twenty twenty one, which is just a quite honestly a few months after our original planned start date of January first, twenty twenty one. So this, you keep break, you keep breaking up. Oh, I do. Let me turn my um, you know, I'll turn my video off. Sometimes I think that helps. Can you hear me better? At this point, yes. Um, I I think this will be an issue of a lot of discussion. Yeah. Um, I I understand the immediate situation with the COVID-19 may create some issues. I'm not so clear on the emergency rule creating an issue. So I want to- We can file the emergency rule. That's not the problem. I think it's the, um, it's our understanding of why the effective date needs to be October 1st when all of the other sections of this bill become effective January 1st. I think the intent is to move people through the system and um, move them back into the community. And that was a recommendation of the Council of State Governments. Is okay, well, opinion. I mean, no, Ellen's on the phone and perhaps Ellen can provide some more um, information around why that recommendation was made that I don't recall having that conversation with the company around the October 1st. I may have misunderstood that, but that is my understanding, as okay. well as increasing the length of time, the length of credit earned from five days to seven days. Right, which I think that it, the department doesn't have any um, issue with that. I, I will say in that same section where it changes five days to seven days. It also changed the word month to 30 yes. days. Right. And that is also problematic for calculating and we would request that the word month be placed back and 30 days be struck. Do you know why that was changed? I do not. Do they know how you accrue, how you count the days or I don't know. I, I know it was changed in Senate Judiciary. I think there was um, a conversation, maybe there was a misunderstanding about the days. But okay. We, we do need the word month to be there. Okay. Butch, Butch has a question. Okay. So, Monica, at the end of the day, uh, on the October 1, 2020 date. Can you stand up a program by then? I and mean, we'll do it if this is what the bill says. Well, that's not the answer. The answer, uh, unfortunately, the answer is can you or can't you? And being being saying that you will do it 
doesn't tell us if you can or can't. <clears throat> it's just that you will. And uh, and understand understanding that the uh, COVID nineteen thing has got you kind of bollocked up a lot. Um, without COVID nineteen, could you stand up that program by October first? It would have been a challenge for us to stand it up by October first. Okay, thank you. Because so often we hear, oh well, well we'll get it done, and then all of a sudden it creates we create legislatively create a problem for you or others, not necessarily all of us in DOC, that we just set these unrealistic dates and expect think good things to happen. And they, they can't. So I guess that answered my question. Thank you. So, Kurt, I know you got a question, but let me clarify what Butch just asked. So on pre-COVID-19, it would have been difficult, but if the legislation stayed for October 1st, you, you would get it up and running. Is that from working on it from July 1st going forward that you could get it up and running if it required October 1st? Uh, I'm not sure I understand your question. So I... My question is that this section is to take effect upon passage. So pre-COVID-19, we would have passed this probably in May, beginning of May, and it would have become affected, effective. So you have from the 1st of May until October 1st to put it in place, not July 1st. So mm. my question is, were you thinking it was July to October? No, so what we were originally thinking was that we would file a rule on July 1st and we would go July 1st, but the language for the effective date for this is upon passage, which pre COVID-19 would have been in May. So it would have been uh, two more months. Upon passage? If you look on the effective dates, set oh, this section and section 16, is effective upon passage. So my interpretation of that was that it was effective on passage that, that and that we still had the, the time frame that on July, by July 1st, we had to file the rule. Not that we had to. You would start working on implementing good time on upon passage, which would have been in May and not July. That was pre-COVID-19. So you had two months or a month, six weeks. To write a rule and file the rule by July 1st. It would just file it. Yeah. And you needed to file it. Um, yeah, it's not clear. It's emergency rules, so it's not clear when you would file. It just said you would file. So that the I program, agree that it's not clear, and that was part of part of the when you file the emergency. Okay, but so in my um, conversations around rulemaking, of course, we can file the emergency rule, and we can. Put the effective date and then the emergency rules are effective for 180 days. So we could file a rule on July 1st and make it effect. I mean, in theory, in practice, we could file a rule on July 1st, it could become effective on October 1st. I don't, and that's something that um, I believe the statute says, but still the, the overall feedback that we're trying to provide to you is that the October 1st date um, pushes up what was already a difficult deadline for us. Okay, I appreciate that. So we have another question, Kurt. Um, I, I think it's maybe a comment, but when you're worrying about all these dates of when things become effective and whether you'll be able to actually have a program working, the, it, the people in, who are incarcerated are going to start calculating it at whatever date this says it becomes effective. So you may not have a program that can handle it until some time, but the people calculating their good time will be saying this became effective at this date. So you should be giving me this amount of time. 
Um, and you have to go back and look back to say how long they've actually done that, how long they've served. And do you see what I mean? Well, actually, the way I understand it is that the good time does not become effective until the rule becomes effective. And so when the rule, whatever date the rule is, if it's October 1st or if it's January 1st, that is the date that people will be able to start accruing credit or start accruing their good time, not upon the effective date of this bill being passed. Okay, I'm, I, I just think we have to make sure that's extremely clear because um, I agree. incarcerated people will look at that and find good sources for litigation if it's not very clear. I agree, it's not clear. When we did earn good time last year, I think we were, we were clear in the language on page 29, number five, we were real clear that the program would become effective upon the department's adoption of the final proposed rule. Right. So what this proposes is they're gonna go forward with emergency rules in the interim of getting their permanent rules adopted. So when they put in those emergency rules and that becomes an emergency rule, they then can start awarding earned good time beginning October 1st. And the emergency rules need to be in place by October 1st. So they're gonna operate for 180 days under the emergency rules before their permanent rules are in place. That's the thinking behind this language. Yeah, that is what this bill says, correct. What this bill says. So Kurt, you still have your hand up? Okay, take your hand down, okay. <laughs> Butch? So Allison, bring, reading that uh, last sentence that you just read about uh, the effective of uh, this and then thinking of Kurt's Mm -hmm. Question. But we deleted it. This this bill this yeah, I know. deletes it. Delete it. I'm, I'm wondering if we should put it back in and change final proposed to emergency rules. That would give clarity, might give clarity to people trying to read the bill and answer Kurt's question about having somebody look at the bill and miss the nuance. Right. Uh, where it's uh, in in parentheses A on this section. Just a thought. Mm -hmm. So we need to do some work on this and this would be working a little bit, I think with Bryn for a little bit more clarification. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay. Anything else? Uh, no, the only other thing that I wanted to, I guess maybe it's a reminder, I'm sure you have forgotten is that we did submit a report and uh, we had that discussion, I believe, in, in January around the availability of good time for inmates who are currently sentenced and if uh, the committee is entertaining adding that to this bill. Correct. And part, of the, the part of the thinking on that, Monica, is we want to make sure that there's a plan in place for notifying the victims and who would um, put that plan in place and who would notify the victims. And the thinking that we had in the committee last week is that our le legislative language would be our intent and the rules would kind of clarify who, who would really develop the plan and notify the victim. And again, I think you know, that's something else to consider in, in terms of timing. Um, if we need to put a plan together to notify the victims and we need to put that in the rule and the rule goes into effect October 1st, that's just another implementation complication. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else, Monica, on good time? I don't have anything else on good time, Dale. I didn't know if you wanted to say anything else about it. No, um, if they have any clarity, we can add more, but um, no, but I'm good with good time. So, um, 
Okay. So uh, I can just continue if you want. Um, this is Dale Crook from yes. Corrections again. Um, so section 17 is, is just more cleanup area. Um, section 18, they added some language back um, around escape language. Um, yeah, this was taken out last year, but it was put back in this year um, with some additions of some changes around um, what page is that? Page 31 um, uh, to put um, escape statute back on um, as a crime that if a violation of this subdivision um, of this uh, subsection requires showing that the person intended to escape from furlough. Um, uh, so we are fine with that language. Um, I think it just, um, it, it just allows for um, if we believe someone has attempted, because furlough is still considered an incarcerative sentence. Um, and this does allow for us to file warrants through the court as a, and as well as um, our commissioner's warrant. Um, one thing that we found out with um, uh, a high profile case um, that without having a warrant signed for the court, a court warrant, court issued warrant allows um, other resources to come in play, such as the U.S. Marshals. Um, so we we had some some. Uh, this would just allow for some more clarity uh, when that happens when we start looking for additional resources to um, to go after an individual that has escaped supervision. Um, uh, not not sure this will have an uh, impact on our bid space. I'm not sure the amount, um, but this was a, a public safety concern and, and we are fine how it is being addressed um, with that language. Um, section 19, we are in favor of this. We think, you know, anytime um, we have data that can look at how a state or criminal justice system is applying its rules fairly and equitably across the board, I think it's always important and it's also always necessary uh, to look to get that information. Um, so we are definitely in support of that as a department. Um, section 20, we have this Department of Corrections Programming and Work Working Group. Um, one thing we would like kind of added in this is to have this work group also look at um, how to expand and make probation more of the standard sentence or um, kind of, it's a, like a work group. We would like to move more cases toward probation to allow probation as a standard um, sentencing direction of the courts. Uh, as a department, we feel that that will um, put a lot of the due process back in the court where it probably belongs. Um, it's their sentence that they're controlling. Uh, the court owns the sentence a little bit more than the department. Um, it also um, allows the department a lot of flexibility with a probation case when it comes to midpoint reviews and early discharges um, while still allowing the ability to revoke probation at the end and still hold someone accountable um, and protect the public. Um, I think it's, it's, it's um, we just like to have this work group kind of explore that as an option. Um, uh, they're looking at a bunch of other different things, especially when we start looking at um, identifying offenders risks and looking at doing assessments before trial. I think this um, would really um, make sense to kind of add exploring that as, as a standard option uh, for the courts to explore. Um, and uh, the last thing is section 21, uh, home confinement furlough and reintegration furlough are appealed. Um, again, I think a lot of that is just un under the concept that we are very complicated. Um, and by re removing those two uh, flavors of furlough, it kind of cleans everything up. Uh, reintegration furlough um, is a pre-minimum release. Um, and what was happening is a lot of the courts and a lot of the um, plea agreements and, and sentencings were adding the RF time into their sentences. And we have a really high non-compliant population. So majority of the individuals didn't get reintegration furlough because they were non-compliant. So in essence, we artificially, it sounds good on the surface, but in reality, artificially, we inflated a lot of sentences um, and most people weren't eligible for. Um, 
So kind of um, getting rid of that. It also cleans up a lot of administrative paperwork because we'd have to review every case coming through at a central level. Um, so doing this, part of it is to reduce a lot of some administrative burden, um, which, which we've been kind of under the gun for a few years now with the department that we have so many processes and our staff, our probation officers and our caseworkers spend a lot of time managing paper and not a lot of time managing people. And um, I think our strength is managing people. And so the more we can uh, remove some administrative burdens on the outside, so spends as well as more time with our, with our offenders, the, the better the outcomes will be across mm -hmm. the board. Um, and for folks, the reintegration furlough was put in when we got rid of good time because we thought that might be some incentive for folks to, uh, correct. Uh, to comply with, with uh, their case plan or not get so many DRs. And home confinement never really took off um, for Neither whatever reason. Home detention. Home, de yeah, home detention, never be there, but that's not in here, just home confinement. <laughs> um, and the, the affected dates, I, and, and we're fine with the affected dates other than I think um, Monica brought up about the, the, the rules. Um, really the issue with that is gonna be, you know, writing of the rule will be easy. It's implementing it and the training and the policies and the changes to our system. That's, that's really where we need the time. Um, and of course, in this current situation, everyone's, you know, you guys are slower in getting stuff done. So is the department. Uh, we're just everyone's kind of scattered um, that and we're focusing on something else right now, to, to be honest. So, um, but that's all my testimony. I will take any questions. Um, Representative Emmons, I will get that language to you and Bren um, within a day or two. Um, I'll run it by okay. Commissioner Baker, make sure he's good with it. And yeah. um, even by the beginning stuff. of next week would be okay. 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 Just to give you some more leeway. So, we do have a question, Butch. Uh, Dale, uh, thanks for your testimony, you and Monica both. Uh, um, this bill's becoming, I think, clearer every day. But uh, I under, in Section 19, uh, under A, uh, there's a report required at the end of that section, and I'm taking a little survey. Uh, the last line says, each stakeholder identified in this subsection shall file, shall report their findings. Uh, and I take... I, I, I read that as every person individually has to do a report. Is that, was that your understanding or, or other? Uh, Representative Shaw, could you tell me what page in line I'm trying to, um... well, I'm, I'm in a different version, but under section 19. Okay. Uh, and in print a, it says during the legislative uh, yep. interim yep. Uh, at the end of that uh, paragraph, it says each stakeholder identified in this subsection. Yep. Okay. Um, I will let Monica chime in on that. She's the one that really um, works in the reports. I would I would view it the way you interpret it. That we would say, um, here's what our findings are. But I'm I'm yep. not. I don't know if it's a joint report from everyone. So I'll let Monica okay. have a her thoughts on right, that. Right, just for the committee's awareness that um, I'm the Department of Corrections representative on the Racial Justice and Disparities Panel, so I attend the meetings on a monthly basis. Um, I think you heard from, from David that the committee met um, just once this year. Problems that kept us together. So my reading of the um, section 19 is that Yes, each stakeholder would report their findings separately, although I do agree that it would make more sense to file um, a report together if we could manage that. Um, particularly since the crime worship group is going to be working with all of us. I wonder if the intent of this was that in the report that each stakeholder um, what has a way of weighing in, particularly if they disagreed. I wonder if that was the way of approaching that. I don't know. Are people thinking? Yeah. So this is just an issue to flag. 
Maybe Bryn can um, give us some thoughts on this. Everybody went on mute, except Mary. I'm on mute. Uh, yeah. Uh, Kurt? I have, a, I, have a, I have a question for Monica when we're done with 338. Okay, so. let's finish up on 338. Anything else? Questions of Dale and Monica pertaining to the bill? I know Ellen's waiting in the wings here, and I, I don't know if we're going to have enough time because we're due to go to 11. Um, we'll figure something out, and Ellen, just hold tight, okay? Okay. Kurt, what's your question on Monica? Um, well, this also, kind of, uh, Ellen might be able to, to uh, assist too because I don't know whether Monica, have you seen the paragraph in the capital budget adjustment thing that we uh, to a straw vote here on that has to do with uh, DOC doing some study for uh, getting numbers for a potential women's reentry facility? Have you seen that paragraph? I have not seen that paragraph. Dale, have you seen okay. that paragraph? No, I haven't. Um, seen it. Okay, it's just I'd be interested in your input on that if you ever get a chance to look at it. Of course, we'll take a look and um, provide if you with feedback. Do you want me? Go ahead. Do you, want, do you want me to send it to you or anything like that that would help? If it's published, if it's published in a version of the bill online, I can certainly find it. It's our latest draft, draft one point eight. And it's in the back. It's very, it's just asking DOC to gather some data about uh, reentry for women and program needs and um, what's available. Okay. And come back with us in January. That sums it up pretty much, right, Kurt? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll take a look. Thank you for pointing that out to us. Anything else from corrections for 338? So Ellen, we have about 10 minutes. How are we gonna proceed here with you? I feel like um, Ellen Whelan Reese with the Council of State Governments Justice Center. I, I can go quickly through, I've just been taking notes on some things that I would like to just add from our perspective or any clarity that might help. And then we have, couple of things um, or just a few things that we would recommend to strengthen the bill, primarily from an implementation and also from a behavioral health standpoint. Um, I'm, I put that in writing and circulated it to a couple of folks and I'm happy to just, um, I think Phil, I may have included you on that as well. So you should have it. And if the committee wants to review that in writing first, that, that's fine with me because it, it pretty much documents what our recommendations there are. I would like the committee to go through those. I think it's going to take longer than 10 minutes. That's yep. a concern. Can you just give the three bullets of what they are? Yep. The just first is, and this, yeah, from an implementation standpoint, um, in speaking with colleagues of mine who have worked with states that have passed justice reinvestment policies and then gone on to receive assistance for implementation, what tends to work really well in their experience is if the, uh, if the state designates a working group or an oversight body of some kind, similar to the working group that worked on the first phase of this project, to sort of oversee implementation. And that would be the, the entity to which my colleagues working on implementation and other departmental um, staff and leadership would report to on sort of what's happening. And it allows for there to be mile markers on progress made, and it sort of keeps a bit of a structure in place for making sure that the implementation is really moving along. So the first recommendation for ours is that um, Senate Bill 338 includes some sort of establishment of what um, oversight committee or body or working group might serve that role. And we have from other states learned some examples about what ideal membership looks like. We also recognize that there might be something in place already in Vermont that can serve that function. So as long as there's some designation, that's our, our primary objective. The second piece is around um, in thinking through if that entity exists, one big piece that we think needs to continue 
moving that we frankly weren't able to, to do enough on from our perspective is more work led by the Agency of Human Services in understanding how people with behavioral health services are who interact with the criminal justice system, particularly in correction settings, are screened for their needs and their, the challenges that they face, mental health or substance use. So where the screenings do occur, which we know that there are screenings in place now, but if there are gaps, what those gaps might be, how that information is collected and shared. We, we understand that there's a lot of information sharing barriers across different agencies, certainly, and even actors and people within agencies have a hard time navigating the legal requirements and where um, laws like HIPAA and other, um, other pieces may or may not allow for more information sharing that would just help more people who work with that individual know what that individual's needs and challenges are. So we recommend, you know, providing updates to an implementation oversight committee around um, where there are barriers around information sharing and where those could be potentially overcome to be still legal, but also more effective in sharing that information. Really, the goal is to make sure that more of that behavioral health needs information be integrated into someone's experience and their case planning while they're incarcerated and particularly when they're in the community. So that um, people who are working with that individual in DOC, as far as DOC staff, but also across the Department of Mental Health, designated agencies, housing providers, just that there's more of a, a conversation around what a person needs so that in theory, you're better able to connect that person to services where they exist. That's a huge amount of, um, of work in some ways to get to, but we've tried to boil that down in what I described in that sort of two page document of, we think even if just AHS took the lead on pulling together the right folks across departments to look at what exists, where there are gaps or challenges and what some opportunities might be to move forward, that that would really keep the process moving. We'd started to have a lot of those conversations through justice reinvestment and just didn't get as far as we think the state could really carry it um, forward. And then there's a technical fix in the Budget Amendment Act 88 around graduated sanctions that we recommend. And that's really my fault. I, I when I had recommended language, just miswrote what it should be. And so there's just a small technical fix, but that has now been signed into the act. And so we're not sure if there's an opportunity to fix that through S338. Um, so, whoops, sorry. I, Alan. I just wanted to note a couple of things from earlier today though. On the good time enactment, I just wanna say we have no, we're sort of neutral on when this happens, except that um, we had calculated all of our modeling around people beginning to be able to earn good time on January 1st, 2021. So, um, leaving all of the mechanics of that to you all, just because I couldn't begin to, to parse out as much as Monica knows or any of you. Um, it's more that from our, our mode of thinking was, can this be something that's effectively happening by January 1st? And then that really informed our, um, our modeling from there. And um, we can work to modify that if, if that timing changes as well. But obviously, the sooner it happens, the sooner people begin earning good time. But we really thought of it as, no, everything, like Monica noted, everything should, we should assume that everything would start to really become real by January of next year. So that's how we were thinking about all the pieces of this stuff. Um, and then... Dale spoke to this, but just a lot on the furlough and 808F and kind of getting rid of certain furlough statuses. From our perspective, a lot of that was informed by Dale and his staff telling us what they found useful in, in what existed in furlough and what's not useful. And recognizing that there's a lot that was created that was intended to be useful that actually is either counterproductive or like Dale noted, DOC through experience found was having negative impacts, so they stopped using those furlough statuses. So it really is meant to sort of clean things up, capitalize on what's effective, and kind of let go of the things that don't work so well. Um, and then I would just say on the issue of the preponderance of the evidence versus the um, clear and convincing, we feel pretty neutral on that and defer to the practitioners who are gonna to have to make that real on what feels most effective. Obviously, as David Shear noted, there's a higher standard for clear and convincing. So it might make it 
easier for folks presumptive parole to go through. Um, but we also have a lot of confidence in, in DOC and the parole board and kind of how they operate around this. So um, we feel like whatever feels appropriate to you all and to the board and DOC works for us. Um, yeah, I'll stop because I know I'm running on everyone's time. Oh, I think you might be on mute, Representative Emmons. I get on mute. Did I hit myself? Um, I think on the three bullets that you talked about, about the working group and then the community services within the Agency of Human Services, <clears throat> as well as uh, graduated sanctions, I know you sent that to a few of us this yesterday. And Phil, you did receive it. I'm wondering, Phil, if you could send that to all of the committee members so that everyone can look at that prior to really looking at the language for that. Did you submit this as well to Bryn, Alan? I think I put Bryn yes, on the did. Yes, she did. I believe you did, yes. Yes, yes, okay. So questions of Alan? So we'll, we'll schedule some time again with you, Alan, I'm sure to go more into depth on some things. Um, we received a lot of information today and tomorrow we look like we're booked up possibly as well. We're gonna need some committee time to really process through some of these changes and talk as a committee as well for this. Any questions of Ellen before we start finishing up our work on 338 this morning? So tomorrow, Phil, we're due to, let me get back to where I was. Trying to pull up our agenda. So tomorrow we're back at 1.30. Correct, and I'm still I'm still waiting to hear from A A H S D C F Ken Schatz, and if I don't hear from him um, by mid afternoon, um, both the Defender General Matt Valerio and either James Pepper or John Campbell are prepared to testify tomorrow, and it's just establishing a time for them to start, and it all depends upon. Commissioner Schatz. So what I would, I know people do want to hear, okay, let's just see if he can do anything tomorrow. And I don't want to push it too much for him because I know that all the commissioners are really working hard. And um, if he can't come in tomorrow, see if he can do it next week on Tuesday. And if he can't, then that takes care of the Defender General and State's Attorney. And then maybe after them, we can just do committee discussion on where we are with 338. Just to let folks know in case you want to listen in tomorrow for that. So pay attention to our agenda when it gets posted, which may not be until later on today or even tomorrow morning. We just have to go with the flow. Anything else before we finish up on 338 and uh, finish our time on YouTube and finish our time for today? If not, I wanna thank folks who are viewing us on YouTube. We appreciate you, you uh, paying attention and listening in. And again, if you have anything you'd like to testify on pertaining to 338, please email myself or Phil Petty, and we will do our best to accommodate. So thank you, and we'll be back on tomorrow at 1.30.